you've, you've raised an issue that could become social cultural. For example, if you find out that a certain types of people mm. are these super- uh, Oh, aerosol. Uh, oh, aerosol. Oh, <laughs> yeah, they call them um, uh, super emitters. Super, super emitters. emitters. Okay, if you find out that super emitters mm -hmm. are all contained within one genetic demographic, that requires a different solution <laughs> yeah. to resolve. Yeah. Because this is, you know, is that any different from the AIDS epidemic? I remember, I'm all old enough to remember, we are old enough to remember that. Yeah. It was like, it was a disease just in homos male homosexuals. So therefore, ban, you know, all, people don't react rationally to that yeah. kind of information. No, yeah. Yeah. So how does your analysis and the revelation of this mm -hmm. manifest in terms of policy? Well, that's this is a this you do you're, you're putting your finger on an extremely important point i would say that you're absolutely right that there are as many troubling outcomes from this as there are positive outcomes and you the, the simple answer is this we have to start the conversation now exactly I, I don't trust us as a species based on the history of anthropology especially european anthropology and what they say about groups and places and, and races and all. not, not I, a good I track record I, the track record is so bad right on up through through eugenics and Nazism, uh, it is so bad. Uh, it may be that we just have to treat everybody equally, knowing that that treatment is excessive for some, but just right for others. But then no one gets differently treated. Yeah. That may be the only solution. Oh, I see what you're saying. So some of us may suffer a little more than others. So that we might achieve a greater good by serving all. So whatever measures have to be taken are taken across the board, even though they don't really apply to me we need as that. much. I think we need that. I got it. Yeah. So for so, so I, my, an example here might be if 90 out of 100 people don't need to wear a mask because they're not spewing thing, it still make everybody wear a mask. You see, that was the no, whole that was the whole problem. That is the whole that problem. the people were like, I don't want to wear a mask. And even though they were like, listen, what we know from 1918, starting back then, what we know for a fact is that masking reduces transmission. We know that for a fact. And people were like, I don't care. It's that's my a different, freedom. That's a different the freedom call yeah, okay. that, that came later and that, that was different. Okay. I'm just making this simple point. Right. That in a society where we want everyone to be treated equally under the law, to have a law that applies only to some people, you must wear a mask and the rest of you don't have to. My experience with our species mm -hmm. tells me that will not work. It, yeah. And so you just make the rule for everyone and yeah. that's it. Well, let me give you another example of the same phenomenon. Okay. Uh, one of the things that criminologists have observed is that these same patterns of extreme variation um, happen in uh, violent crime. Yes. So I look at a map of New York City, and it's up any city for that matter, and you will find that on like 5% of street segments, blocks, 5% uh, of street segments of, of New York City account for north of 50% of all violent crime. Mm -hmm. It's super specific. When I say a street segment, so we're talking about, we're not saying the South Bronx is a dangerous place. This, no, no, this is saying, no, 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 most of the South Bronx is totally safe. safe, but there are very specific. Or there's a there are there's ten a, hot spots. Yeah, there's a street corner on the right. you know on on York and ninety uh, first. That's problematic. So the rational response to that is to say, oh, we don't need police. The same distribution of police in every precinct in the city. What we should be doing, and this is what the, the NYPD did, and that caused the second great decline, crime decline in New York which was they said, okay, we're just gonna shift huge numbers of resources from you know, the 90% of places that are relatively safe and just dump them on those very, very specific hotspots. I'm sure that people anticipated the very argument that you're making, saying people are gonna to object to that. They're gonna say, you're taking 10 of my police officers away from my precinct so you can send them to a street corner in like, you know, East New York, why? That's unfair, blah, blah, blah. As it turns out, the what people were, I think were able to realize was that bringing the overall crime rate in the city down was uh, was a um, made that price worth paying. That mm. you could convince them by showing them, oh, this is gonna make the whole city a better place for all of us. You can give up your 10 why, cops. Why didn't the crime just move to another block? It was well, like pornography is, no, 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 uh, this, so in this Times is, Square. 
you know, you, you knock it out here, then it went to Seventh Avenue, to Eighth right, Avenue, right, to Tenth right, Avenue. Right. Then it went on the internet. Right. And now everybody's yeah, got yeah, it. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is <laughs> you're not going to get rid of something that kind of built yeah, no, into Neil, the system. No, though this was so. This is a fascinating area of criminology. This is one of the great insights. After they made this observation, they then went to this very question: displacement, as it's called in criminology, which is okay. If I send ten cops to the corner of you know York Avenue and Ninety First, do the bad guys just move? To the 93rd. 93rd. Right? 95th. And the answer is, they don't. They do in a little bit. I mean, do you see some displacement? But to a remarkable extent. Criminals are lazy. <laughs> is that or is? They're, either, they're both lazy. Walk away. Bring it. You keep your wallet. God. <laughs> no, no. Dude, there's cops. Let's do it again tomorrow. <laughs> no, you're right. Uh, uh, the word they would use is that criminology is rooted in place. In other words. Gotcha. More, than, more than the individual. Oh, absolutely. So Whoa. the famous work on this was done, I think, for the first time in Seattle. And they and it took it's a very simple thing, but no one did it for the longest time, which was to overlay crime data on a map. Right? No one had ever done it in a systematic way. And when they finally started doing this, the guy who did it is a guy named Weisberg, David Weisberg. What they discover is this pattern that like there's like, look at the map. He's I started in Seattle. You look at the map of Seattle, there's like 15 hotspots in Seattle where a huge proportion, a hotspot is a block, a huge proportion of violent crime is happening at any given moment. So then they say, okay, what happens when we look at next year's data? Did the spots move? They don't move. What happens if we look five years later? Do the spots move? They don't move. Spots aren't moving. It's, and I don't, no one can, can no one has a kind of ultimately satisfactory answer for this because you would think that this would be random, right? Right. It's not random. It is, and they can take you. I've actually, I have been, someone took me on a tour of Baltimore, a guy who worked with Weisberg, a woman who worked with Weisberg. We drove around Baltimore for a day and she did this exact thing. We were, we'd drive through like the worst neighborhoods in West Baltimore and she would say, uh, this block, no crime. This block, no crime. This block, the crime here for like 15 years. Next block, no crime. Next crop. It's the strangest thing. Wow. It really is the strangest thing. These are fascinating revelations. All of your books do that for the reader. It's like, well, I never knew that. I never do. Because yeah. you did all the homework, right? And you put it in the book. Mm -hmm. So if you arrive at these points of awareness, presumably they lead to solutions so that there would ultimately be no problems left for you to write about in a book. So what's what's going on there? I have there? confidence that there will always be problems <laughs> to me to write about, Neil. It's just a question. <laughs> and you fix it in one place, and then you move, and then it gets it goes goes no, bad. Those again. spots move. Those, those spots move. Those yeah, spots yeah, move. yeah.